a Greek mathematician best known for his thesis on geometry presented in a collection of 13 books called The Elements. Although little is known about his life, Greek philosopher Proclus, in his summary of famous Greek mathematicians, suggests that Euclid was born in 300 BCE and taught in Alexandria, Egypt in the time of the Macedonian king Ptolemy I. Sotter. Euclid was perhaps the most prominent mathematician of Greco-Roman antiquity and his works are said to be the second most studied books after the Bible. Say you're standing at the origin of an infinite orchard. You can think of the trees as mathematically small lattice points on a grid which align cardinally with north, south, east and west. So if you look randomly in any single direction, what is the probability that you would see a tree? A model for this can be produced by describing each tree as mathematically thin. These points can be labelled by using the gradient. Take the closest tree to you at a position of 1, 1. Its gradient, rise over run, is 1. So, any tree with a gradient of 1 will be blocked by the first tree. Another example is, let's say, a tree at 4, 3, which has a gradient of 3 quarters. This method of labelling trees is the same for all trees. Any tree with the same gradient as another will be blocked by the closest tree. It is then obvious that there are an infinite number of different trees that can be seen, and hence, an infinite number of unique gradients. So what is a rational number? The definition for a rational number is simply the quotient of two integers. The name rational is based on the word ratio, which is a comparison of two or more numbers and can be written as a fraction. If you go back to the model, all trees and their gradients make fractions. It can be said that all the possible gradients to look at will be rational numbers. Now, the question is, how can we list these rational numbers? The idea of infinity is that the numbers go on forever. It is possible to list all of the rational numbers up to infinity by constructing an infinite rectangle or array of fractions. This is done by horizontally listing all of the fractions with the number 1 in the numerator. For this, we start from 1 on 1 and go up to 1 on 2, then 1 on 3, 1 on 4, etc. In the next row, the fractions have 2 in the numerator and start from 2 on 1, then 2 on 2, 2 on 3, and so on. This pattern continues infinitely. However, if we listed the numbers along the rows, the rows would go on infinitely, and we would never reach the next row if we tried to list the columns, so instead we list them diagonally. Every single fraction will appear somewhere on one of these diagonal lines. As opposed to rational numbers, irrational numbers are numbers that cannot be expressed as simple fractions. These numbers have decimal expansions that neither terminate nor become periodic. An example of such a number is pi, which has an infinite decimal expansion, meaning that the digits after the decimal place never end. But what happens when we try to list these numbers? Let's say we listed all the irrational numbers we could think of between 0 and 1. So now let's make a new number through this following method. The first number must be different to the first number's first digit, and the second digit must be different to the second number's second second digit, and so on and so forth, making a diagonal. So we make a number like this. This number is not the first number because it is different in the first place, and so on and so forth. So we have just made another number on our infinite list, and we can keep on doing this. This property of the irrational numbers is said to make them uncountable, which means that this set is infinitely larger than the rational set of numbers. So, if there are infinitely more irrational gradients for us to look at and we randomly look in any direction, we are infinitely more likely to choose one of these irrational points and hence the probability of seeing a tree is zero or you will only see light wherever you look. Okay, of course as soon as any one of these trees were so much as a millimetre thick, you would no longer see anything but trees. So how does Euclid's orchard problem relate to our world? Understanding this complex problem develops high level thinking which is useful throughout a range of academic subjects and fields. These skills are also important and very useful when it comes to everyday problem solving. Also, Euclid's orchard problem helps us to develop a firm knowledge of the sometimes counterintuitive properties of infinity which is imperative in mathematics and computer science. Finally, and perhaps most importantly, understanding Euclid's orchard may save your life if you're lost in an orchard surrounded by trees which you are allergic to, having a sound understanding of the problem will ensure that you know to just pick a direction and walk straight, which will ensure that you never touch a fruit tree.